Lord, I ask that you center us. Center us today on your face, your holy word, your gifting. Lord, that all the things that are going on in our lives, that we just let those be for just a moment. And we just focus in on your word and your glory, Lord. Lord, that you would help us to hear only those things you would have us hear. Lord, that the Holy Spirit, you would speak directly to us through your word. And Lord, that it would be abundantly clear in our ears and our minds and our hearts what our next steps are be. So Lord, as we center ourselves on our knees before you, entering into your holy of holies, find us pure. Forgive us of those sins we may commit, either wittingly or unwittingly. But forgive us. And help us to be pure before you as we we come before you on bended knee and lifted hearts, bowed heads. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've been talking through the book of Philippians, and we're going to continue on that today. Philippians is short, only four more sermons to go. Um, I'm not joking. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, um, and uh, it's four, but it's a short book, only four chapters long. And we've got to remember it's a letter written to the church of Philippi as, as Paul is in prison and, and facing death, but it's all about joy. And so we find Paul today speaking at joy. And we've, he's, this whole time he set himself up as follow my example. Follow my example. Follow my example. Just let it lead you to Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that's where we find ourselves today. So let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading 12 through 16 today. Let's stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. And it says, Not that I already received this or have already been made perfect, but I press on if Indeed, I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Brothers, do not consider myself to have laid hold of it. But I do one thing, forgetting the things behind and straining towards the things ahead. I press on towards the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many are perfect, let us hold this, uh, this opinion. If you think anything differently, God will reveal this also to you. Only to what we have attained to the same hold on. To the, to the same hold on. Woo. All right. These are the words of God for the people of God. The people of God said, Amen. 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 May be seated. Verse 12 there starts out with something a little unique, doesn't it? I mean, he set himself up as a example this whole time he's been like follow me follow me and i'll lead you to christ follow me i'm an example do as i do and you'll be following god which is what we're all supposed to be doing right but it's scary to open ourselves up like that and here right off the bat he seems like but wait i have not received it yet i'm not there yet so it seems a little strange because he's been setting us up this whole time. Follow me, follow me, follow me. I'm not there yet, guys. <laughs> Paul doesn't want his readers to misunderstand him and say, hey, I figured it all out. He wants them to know that I'm about to die. He's in his 60s. I ain't got a clue on some things yet. 
I think that sometimes we make that mistake sometimes. We, we think we've got it all figured out. It happens to everyone when they're young, I'm told. Um, but then we grow out of it. But then sometimes we do it all our lives. I mean, how many of us have gone to Sunday school and you say, well, I've read this passage before. Or you go to, you're reading your Bible and said, I remember reading that. And you say, I've, I've heard this. So you go to the sermon and you're like, oh, I remember that passage. I've already studied it. And you kick back and say, well, maybe I don't have to listen. And it's not uncommon. And we all have periods in our lives when we do that. But we have to be careful because Paul's saying, hey, this is Paul we're talking about who arguably wrote 13 books of the Bible. I'm not going to get into the arguments. But arguably 13 books of the Bible that we read, and he's saying, I ain't got it all figured out yet. So I want you to know that. There's a disclaimer. And I think that humanizes Paul. You know, sometimes I think we, we make the mistake of thinking it's, it's us and them over there. You know, Paul is up on this pedestal, and there's John and Matthew, and they, they're kind of different from us. But they're just people. I mean, they're people. And we read the Bible, like the book of Acts, and you see that Paul had disagreements with people, and he couldn't work with some people. You see that he actually makes some mistakes in the book of Acts. Not like sins, but some things. He could have managed things a little differently. We see, you know, that Matthew says, well, you know, he's, he's writing it down, but Matthew's not writing it chronologically. He's writing it down with a theme. And, and we, John's in trying to push up interest. And Luke's being a historian, so he skips some things. And, you know, we, we want to separate them from just being people. But they're just people. Which means they're struggling with the same things we're struggling with. It means they're, they're dealing with the same issues. They're, they've got fears. You know, Paul is in prison and he's acting like he's all got it all figured out. And he's content. But I guarantee there's times at night when he's laying in his bed thinking, I don't want to die. I mean, Jesus did. And he guarantee Paul was too. Yeah, he, in his rhetoric, he's writing it out. Be courageous, be courageous. And he wants them to follow that pattern. But I guarantee at night, he's, he's like, Lord, I need my own. <laughs> I need to follow my own advice. Because he's just a person. He's just a person living life for God. He wasn't incredibly different from us. So when Paul says, you know, what really matters is, is the prize of God's calling. It's not like he's saying, I've figured it all out. I know exactly how to get there. I know exactly where to go. He's just saying, I'm just living life, pushing on towards the goal, just like you are. And he's, you know, he's, our, he's on death row. He doesn't know where he's going to end up. He said, he said earlier in the letter, I have full confidence that I will return to you. Guess what? He never makes it. He never comes back. He thought he was going to get out of this one. He doesn't. So when he says that, he's, he's saying, I just, I just want you to know that, the, that, when he says that, he's saying, I just, you know, I want you to know that I'm pressing on towards the goal. I'm not separate from you. I'm not different. I'm just like you. And I want you to know that. But at the same time, he says, follow me, which is scary for us, normal people. <laughs> and he's a normal person saying, it's scary for me too, because <laughs> I don't have it all figured out. He's sending Barnabas you know, and Timothy, and, and he's, you know what, I don't have it all figured out. He says, what really matters is we press on with that goal. We struggle. To grow. I mean, we're created to grow in Christ. But not just to grow, but, but to become whole. I think that's the word I'm looking for, whole. 
Because we're incomplete without God. We're broken. That sin entered into our lives and we became less than human. And so we've been called on this path to press on to the goal to become fully human. And he's saying, I'm not fully human yet. Paul's saying, I'm not there yet. I'm just like you. I'm, I'm pressing on towards the goal. I'm pressing on. And the pattern is clear, you know, that, that there are people that we are perfect, not in ourselves, but in God. You know, the church a long time ago made the mistake of setting saints separate from everybody else. Saints. Saints separate from everybody else. And they had saints. The saint of this and the saint of that and the saint of this. And if you did these certain things, you could become a saint. And the rest of you aren't saints. Everyone else, these guys are saints. And we can pray to the saints. That's what the church did at one point. And they made that mistake. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not them and then us. It's us following God. It's we're saints that sometimes mess up. That means if you have accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you're following His ways, committed to Him, you're a saint. Now you're going to mess up. <laughs> Every one of those saints messed up. You're going to mess up. But you're a saint. You've got to be a saint. can't be a hypocrite. We're not talking about hypocrites that sometimes get it right. We're talking about saints. You're a saint. You're a saint that's trying to figure it out, just like Paul was. You're trying to grow to become whole. You're not different from them. You're made perfect not by some miracle other than Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes you perfect. And so therefore you can't be them and then us because you all have the same Jesus. And I love what that does for us as a community. Is it doesn't separate us. Oh, well, he's got to figure it out, she's got to figure it out, and then there's me. It ain't that. It's us and Jesus. He's the one that's different. We're just on this side trying to figure it out. He's over here. He's the one that's different. And so it allows us to have that space in the community to be gracious with each other. To say, you know what? We're all just trying to figure it out. Let me show you a path that I found works in your circumstance. When I was going through something similar, here's a path that worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you too. And you can follow that path. Or maybe you can say, well, here's what Jesus says on this circumstance. Jesus says, you know what, there's a better way. And let me tell you how Jesus said to follow that path. Because it's, it's us over here trying to figure out, and Jesus. And if we take that into consideration in our very way of thinking, it changes the way we deal with each other. Because we're not going to judge each other. Well, you're over there, you're a sinner over there, and I'm a saint. <laughs> well, saints by the grace of God, Amen. trying to figure it out. Pressing on to the goal. And so he wants us to know that you got to be pressing on. He says, I want you to be godly motivated. We press on because we know Jesus Christ. So we know move towards the goal that he has placed us to. Sometimes we lose sight of that goal and we have to 
come back. How many of you guys have gone through that in your life? I've been there. You lose a little sight. God calls you back, says, yeah, I'm over here. And you're like, Ooh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> but we've all been there. Most of us have been there at some point. If you haven't gone there, you're going to be. <laughs> And so it calls, sometimes we lose sight in our godly motivations. Sometimes we lose sight even in godly motivations. I was reading a book this last week um, by a friend of mine, actually written by a friend of mine. She's a missionary in the Congo currently. At the time she wrote the book, she was in Benin, uh, West Africa. Um, and I, I, th- I thought I wanted to quote it out. This book is called Beyond Surrender by Barbara Singerman. Now, because she's a friend of mine and because it's a really good book, I'm recommending everyone go buy it. Um, <laughs> but no, she wrote this back in 2003. And it's a story about how they were called to the mission field and the challenges they went through in going to a place that's not the United States, in any shape or form. And the stories in there, some of the stories in there will just astound you. I mean, we're talking people coming back from the dead. We're talking about people being kicked out of their homes. We're talking about voodoo priests coming after the, the missionaries. We're talking about, I mean, things that you're like, does that stuff really happen? And this is from her. And I know her personally. So I know she's not lying. Um, so I'm going to read a, a small quote from her. This is before they get the call. It says, I had my life all planned out. Jeff, he's the husband, was to become a famous youth pastor with such an incredible ministry that he would fly around the country as the guest speaker for massive youth rallies. We would build a beautiful home with a spacious front porch on which we would relax on cool summer evenings, snuggle together for quiet moments during the rain. We would rear our children in Christ. I would have a flourishing woman's speaking ministry. Pride was strong in my family. (laughs) So strong in it, I had convinced me that it had convinced me that all these things were God given goals. My pride and I didn't have a problem with it, but God did. Now she's going to go on and be a missionary, still over there overseas. But as I read that, it it went along really well with this because it, it was the center was that God has to be the center of our motivation, not ourselves. And sometimes it's easy to lie to ourselves and say this is a God-given. I mean, because they're not bad things. I mean, Abraham and Lot, standing up on a hill. You go this way, I'll go this way. You go that way, I'll go that way. Lot looks and says, oh, I'm going to go to this land right there. Not a sin. But not the best decision. And he lied to himself and said, that's where God wanted me to go. But if you go back and read that, he never asked. And sometimes we, we do that with ourselves. We, we, we lie to ourselves. We listen to lies when we don't even realize it. We get swept away from the truth. And we have to be honest with ourselves and, let God, and with God and, and, and say, okay, God, where are you working? And where do you want me to move towards it? It's not, okay, God, I want you here with me. He's already working. Where we, does he want us to join in with him at? Because he's already at work. He's already at work all around your life. And he's saying, okay, I've got a goal for you. I need you to join me over here. And a lot of times we say, well, God, I'm over here. Why don't you come here? And God said, that's not how it works. I'm over here. Get your butt over here. (laughs) 
And we struggle. We struggle to press on towards the girl. We've let. We got to let the Word of God be our, our guide. Not some other scriptures. Not some Bible study leader. I'm not saying Bible study leaders are bad. Don't hear that. I listen to a lot of different Bible study leaders. Wouldn't change it for the word world. I listen to a lot of sermons because I don't get to hit. I don't. I have to. I don't get to sit where you're at. I have to go somewhere else to hear my. I wouldn't change that. But they can't be my guide. It's the Bible. And sometimes we means we have to do the work. The challenge is if we want to press on towards the goal, we have to move forward. A lot of times I say, well, I want to press on towards the goal from right where I'm at. We get comfortable. That's why they call it a comfort zone, right? Because you're comfortable. I mean, how many of you are in your seat? There's a whole section over here that's empty. <laughs> but you're in your seat. You're comfortable. But we do that in life. We get comfortable. We have to press forward, which means sometimes you have to step out of that comfort zone and change. We can't keep our minds our thoughts and our hearts in the past. Sometimes it's hard to leave the past. You get hurt. That's a wonderful example of how when it's hard to leave the past, you get hurt. It's tempting to grab hold of the past and, and say, that's going to define me. And, and some of you in this room, I know from personal conversations I had with you, you're still there. And for some of you, I, I don't know, but I suspect. <laughs> and it's easy to do. I mean, there's some things that, that will want to keep you in the past. The hurt, abuse, neglect, the loss, past glories. Because you feel like you've got no glory here. And so we, we can hear, we can get caught in the past. And the problem with being caught in the past, I'm not saying forget the past. Don't hear that. It's important to know where you came from. It helps define you. You can use it. God can use it. But you've got to step forward. You've got to keep going forward. And if you've got your eyes in the rearview mirror, you're going to hit someone in front of you. You ever tried driving with your eyes in the rearview mirror? Unless you're going backwards, it ain't going to work very well. I remember when I first started learning to drive, you're trying to figure out how to use the mirrors, right? I was luckily I was on a dirt road because I got a little distracted over something that was in my side rear view mirror. And all of a sudden I'm almost in a ditch. But that's how we do in real life, isn't it? You get distracted by something in the past, and all of a sudden we're going off course. So we got to move forward. We got to keep our eyes on the fire that was in the night and the smoke that was in the day, right? That's what God used to light the way and call them forward. God didn't stay in the back and say, okay, you guys go over there. He said, come, I'm over here. And so we got to press on just like that. And then as we move forward, sometimes we lose sight of what's right in front of us. And therefore, you can't get around it. You say, I see the end goal right there. For some of you, that next goal is death, and that's where you're at. <sighs> when I'm in heaven, that's... But you're not dead yet, so you're just sitting here waiting. <laughs> but 
But I see this when I used to work with seminary students. The end goal was whatever their ministry was, whether a pastor or youth minister or music minister, whatever it was. But they forget that they're in class right now. There's things in your life that God is moving you towards a goal. And He wants you to have a goal. But you've got to deal with the things that are right in front of you. You can't get to the end goal of owning your own house if you can't pay your car bill right now. Spending all your money on a new house that you don't own. You've got to take care of what's in front of you. It also means with people. It isn't enough to say, well, I'm going to meet the people that have gone before me and died. I can't wait to meet Jesus. Well, I'm fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm excited to meet Jesus too. But there are people right here around you that need to know Him too. There are people right here around you that need to know what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And you're the one that needs to lead them. We've got to be the ones that lead the way. We've got to take care of what God has placed in front of us to get through it. You can't get over the hill unless you start moving, taking care of the hill. It ain't going to just magically disappear. You got to go through it, around it, over it. So as I was thinking of goals, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I know I'm already running late. But I went through the Bible and found some godly goals. Some things that are in the Bible. First thing I found was to please God. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Therefore indeed we we have as our ambition, whether at home or in the body or absent from the body, to be acceptable to Him. You can also see Romans 14, Ephesians 5, Ephesians, uh, Colossians 1. A goal of, to please God. That should be one of our goals, shouldn't it? I want to be pleasing to God. I don't want to be pleasing to any other God. Except Yahweh, Jesus Christ, the Holy Trinity. I want to be pleasing to Him. I don't want to be pleasing to just myself. God doesn't just want you to be happy. That's what the world will tell you. He just wants you to be happy. That's not what the Bible says. He says, I want you to be pleasing to me. He says, I want you to know me. We already read in Philippians 3.8. says, more than that, I even consider all things to be lost because of the surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for the sake of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, considering them dung in order that I may gain Christ. You can also see that in John 17, Second uh, Peter 3. To be faithful... Remain in me, Jesus says, and I in you. Just as a branch is not able to bear fruit unless it remains in the vine, neither so can you unless you remain in me. See Matthew 10, Matthew 24, Philippians 3, 2 Timothy 4, Hebrews 12, Romans, uh, Revelation 2. I just grabbed a few. To love one another. That's a godly goal. Sometimes we put this goal ahead of loving God. We can't do that. God says, love God, love your neighbor. He didn't say, love your neighbor, then love God. God comes first. So in the image of God, we love. So we have to keep that in mind. But love one another. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. That you love one another. You can also see Matthew 22, John 15, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Timothy 1, 1 John 4. 
live at peace. This is a hard one for a lot of us. We like to bicker. We like to be divided. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible on your part, be at peace with all people. If it's, notice it says if it's possible on your part. Some people won't let you be at peace. They're just not going to let you. <laughs> but don't let them that you be your problem. Put that on them. Mark 9, 2 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians uh, 13, 1 Thessalonians 4. Be at peace. Spread the gospel. That's a godly goal right there, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanding you. And behold, I am with you. All the days until the end of the age. We're called to go and spread the gospel. But not just evangelize. But take the gospel in the way we live. And teaching others to live according to the gospel. That's where it gets harder, right? It's actually, oh, you know, some of you are afraid. I can't tell people about Jesus. Well, that's the easy part. But showing them how to live forces us to live. And say, hey, you follow me and I'll be and you'll be following Christ is scary. Because we know we're just trying to figure it out. <laughs> to grow to maturity. Ephesians 4.13, until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to measure the maturity of the fullness of Christ. It's not enough just to say, okay, I'm saved, I'm good. It's not just enough to say, okay, I went through the VBS, I'm good. It's not good as to say, okay, well now I'm 60, I'm good. It's not just, okay, I'm retired, I'm good. It's a continual growing to maturity. And physical age has very little to do with it. Because I have met some really uh, people with lots of birthdays behind them. And uh, they act very immature in Christ. And I have met some people with very few birthdays under them that act very mature in Christ. So physical age has very little to do with it. Your final goal is heaven, right? Revelation 7, 9, and 10 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great crowd that no one was able to number from every nation and every tribe and people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb dressed in white robes with the palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out to the, in loud voices saying, Salvation to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Our end goal is heaven. So we should be striving for the goal of being in heaven, not just being in heaven, right? Some of you are just like, well, as long as I get in the gate. <laughs> I can squeak in as long as I can suck it in and I can squeeze in. That's, that's where you're at. The Bible talks about crowns. Now, the Bible talks about throwing your crowns down in his feet, but it talks about the, the desire to these, these rewards, these, and they're important that we, we build up rewards in heaven and these crowns in heaven, that we live a life that is, is worthy to be in heaven. And I love the idea that we, we live a life 
that is worthy of heaven to build up these crowns and then we get to just toss them down at his feet. Because all our, all our crowns are, 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 are his. His glory. But we live in such a way that we build up those crowns. And it's important. And so it is important that we have these goals in mind that, hey, I'm building up some crowns in heaven. Because I want to toss them at Jesus' feet. (laughs) I don't have nothing to toss at Jesus' feet. So you just want to squeeze in and have nothing to give him. And God guarantees... And I love this. This is the joy. Remember, I always talk about the book being joy. This is the joy. God guarantees that if you follow Him, believers will reach their goal. Not the goal of some earthly flesh. I want, you know, 10 acres of, you know, with cows or, you know, 100 acres of cows. No, I'm talking about your godly goals that God has put before you. And God guarantees that you're going to reach your goal. For example, in my father's house, there are many rooms. But if not, I would not have told you. Because I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and you receive you to myself. So that where I am, there you may also be. And you can see these things in John 6 and Romans 8, Ephesians 1 and Philippians 1 and 2 Timothy 1 and 2 Timothy 2 and Revelations 3. I could go on, but I won't. But we have to have goals. And I think our next step has to be is what goals are we pressing forward to? You know, that book that came out, Purpose Driven Life, came out a while back ago. Many people flocked to it. I thought it was an okay read. But what was good about it was it brought to attention that there are goals that we need to be reaching towards. You can't just be, isn't it good enough just to be doing church? What's the purpose? Where are you going? What goals has God laid out before you and that you're trying to accomplish? How are you pressing forward in it? I gave you some godly goals, but I know that each of you have probably some, some personal goals that He's laid out before you. You know, I, I want to stop looking in the past and move forward. I want to... I start reading my Bible on a daily basis. I want to uh, meditate. I want to take a day and fast. I want to put away this sin, whatever your sin is. Godly goals, but also personal goals that He's pushing you forward with. And some of you are like, well, you know, is their their job related goals? I, you know, and some of it's church-related goals, and some of it's retired-related goals, and some of it's and the goals before you. So what are your goals? Maybe you don't know. You say, I have no idea what my goals are. I'm going to encourage you to think about this, pray about it, and write them down. If you go in my office, I change it quite a bit, but there's a focus board on the wall. Because sometimes I need to turn around and say, okay, what am I pressing towards? Now, the stuff on that office is kind of old because I've moved a lot of it to my computer because that's the guy I am. Uh, But, you know, what am I pressing forward to? I like to keep that focus before me. Why am I doing this? Why do I want small groups in the church, community groups? Which is, by the way, somewhere that we will be moving towards as soon as I figure out how I want to do it. (laughs) I'm praying about that. Let God reveal it to me. Why do we need the stewardship committee? (laughs) Well, they're important. Don't get me wrong. But we got the committee has to ask itself, 
Why are we doing things the way we're doing? How can we divide the money that God has given us properly? For what goals? Why do we want the expansion? Is it for new offices? No. There are reasons like security and to move the bathrooms out of the sanctuary. Um, and to stop the bathrooms from overflowing every other week. Uh, yes, that is a problem. I have that pet peeve. <laughs> But is it something we should do this year, next year? These are things we have to address. Why? Why did we hire Tristan? Well, I've got some very good reasons to Tristan, for we hired Tristan. One of the top ones, I'm tired of working 60 hours a week. <laughs> but no. What goals? Why are you reaching towards them? If you don't have goals, then you're just doing church. Or doing life, you're not going to go anywhere. So write it down. I think we should go to a time of.